Uh, my name is Chris Klein, and I'm a Global Senior Principal for Sustainability and ESG at Stantec, and I'll be facilitating the webinar for today. Before we get started, uh, a couple of housekeeping items we just wanted to review. Um, all of you are in uh, muted during the presentation, but if you have questions, please type the questions in the question panel on your webinar dashboard. At the end of our panel di panelist discussion, we'll be happy to answer the questions that, that you have. Um, our webinar today is being recorded and a copy of the presentation along with some supporting materials will be sent to you after, after we, today's webinar. So for those of you who are familiar with Stantec, you know that safety is critical to our business. And we like to start every meeting with a safety moment. If we go to the next slide, uh, appropriate for our topic today, our safety moment will address a key aspect of climate change staying safe through extreme weather events. The science tells us we should expect more extreme weather events in the coming years and decades, extreme heat, severe storms, rain events, and associated flooding. Today for our safety moment, we'd like, we're gonna focus on just one of these, working in high heat and humidity. And if there's just uh, three points we'd like you to remember from this uh, safety moment, it's water, rest, and shade. Uh, if you're working or, or active and it's extremely hot and humid, uh, drink cool water frequently. Uh, a quart, an hour, uh, every 15 minutes is the recommended amount. Uh, and just as importantly, think about others in your group and remind folks in, in your group or your work party uh, to also be hydrating. Make sure you have a ready supply of water available. Secondly, take breaks and rest in the shade if you're working outdoors. Use a portable canopy if you have one, or obviously trees uh, to provide shade. If you don't have either of those and you need to rely on a vehicle, remember that those vehicles also get very hot very quickly, and you need to make sure you, you can run the air conditioner to keep a, a cool place to, to cool off in. In terms of clothing, again, lightweight, loose-fitting clothing is, is the best option that, uh, that you should use in, in extreme heat weather. Uh, some PPE is designed for extreme heat and humidity, so make sure that that is available to your team. Finally, uh, sunscreen should be applied prior to prolonged sun exposure and reapplied frequently throughout the day. We just urge you all to stay safe uh, out there. Uh, we're all through across the country, we're experiencing some extreme heat. So uh, today's webinar addresses a dynamic and complex topic. The proposed regulation, we can go on to the next slide, the proposed regulation put forth by the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission entitled Rules to Enhance and Standardize Climate-Related Disclosures for Investors. It's a dynamic topic because the rules are not yet final. Public comment just closed last week. However, postponing thinking about these requirements until they become final could place a company at a disadvantage relative to your peers and competitors. And it's a complex topic because climate change is a complicated issue. These rules, once they're final, will apply to literally every area of our economy. But unlike the finance and accounting issues, which the SEC typically oversees, complying with these rules will require expertise that typically falls outside the core strengths of accounting and law firms. Successfully benchmarking, managing, and mitigating climate risks requires insight from climate scientists engineers, and other technical professionals, such as those that on the 25,000 person strong Stantec team. That's why we put together a top flight panel of Stantec scientists and policy experts to help us understand the key elements of the proposed climate rules and lend some insight into what companies should do to prepare for its implementation. Let me introduce our panel to you. Tim Riley is a senior principal with expertise in sustainability and climate risk disclosure. Tim leverages cutting edge techniques to solve real world environmental problems effectively and cost efficiently. Yasmin Sultana. Yasmin is a greenhouse gas expert with almost 15 years of experience in consulting for greenhouse gas programs at large energy and industrial clients. She assists our clients with developing their greenhouse gas portfolio and carbon programs, to satisfy our various corporate, voluntary, and regulatory reporting needs, including developing greenhouse gas reduction plans. Gwen Lucia is an ESG professional with a strong commitment to health equity. And as we've learned in our safety moment, climate change affects human health. 
Like you asked me, Gwen is a, GH, a GHG expert with particular understanding of global greenhouse gas frameworks similar to those proposed by the SEC. Finally, Olivia Lelick is an epidemiologist with broad sustainability experience focused on ESG and health policy. On our next slide, we'll see today's agenda. Olivia will begin by providing some background on the proposed SEC rules. Gwen will then cover the key compliance components, which should be top of mind for companies covered by these rules. Tim will then share his insight on how companies might address these compliance issues. Yasmin will follow Tim and will share her experience helping companies to effectively prioritize action and integrate a science-based programmatic approach to effectively address these issues in these rules. I'll wrap up our discussion by describing some actions companies can take now in anticipation of that final rule. We'll then have time to answer any questions from the audience. Again, feel free to type those questions into the uh, box on your, on your dashboard. And with that, we'll begin with Olivia providing context on this rule. Thanks, Chris. So as Chris mentioned, I'll be kicking us off by going over some background information on the proposed rules. Next slide, please. In March of this year, the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission proposed rules to enhance and standardize climate-related disclosures for investors. So before we discuss the proposed disclosures, I'll be covering the context of the rules to help you understand why the SEC decided to take action on climate-related disclosures at this time. On the next slide, please. So to put the SEC's proposed disclosures into context, it's important to understand the state of climate and other ESG-related disclosures in the U.S. and globally. At this time, there are only voluntary frameworks and standards in the U.S., and these frameworks, such as the Global Reporting Initiative, or GRI, the Value Reporting Foundation SASB Standards, and the Task Force on Climate-Related Disclosures, or TCFD, provide guidance on climate and other ESG-related information that companies should report. And companies who choose to do so typically report this information in various formats within corporate sustainability reports, integrated reports, or other voluntary reports posted on their websites. Globally, there are ESG reporting requirements in some countries. So for example, the EU's Sustainable Finance Disclosure Regulation, or SFDR, went into effect last year. And this regulation requires all financial market participants and advisors to disclose a broad range of ESG-related information and risks, including climate-related disclosures. Canada is at a similar stage as the US in terms of required reporting, having recently introduced mandatory climate-related disclosures that apply to financial institutions with the goal of mandatory reporting across the Canadian economy. And these rules will follow a phased approach with the first required disclosures beginning in 2024. And each of these um, reporting requirements are aligned with the TCFD's recommended disclosure framework, which we'll similarly see with the SEC's proposed rules. On the next slide. So at the same time, companies are receiving pressures to focus and report on ESG-related information from a variety of sources including customers and consumers, insurance companies, and investors and shareholders. And in particular, according to the SEC, investors are demanding more and better climate-related information to support their decision-making and risk management. And investors have expressed that the current variation and voluntary nature of ESG disclosure frameworks can produce inconsistent, incomparable, and unreliable data. We're also seeing a trickle-down effect from the global regulations and industry trends toward comprehensive and standardized ESG reporting, such as those that I just described in the EU. So for example, some companies in the US are already being required to compile this information for investors that are based in countries that have climate-related disclosure requirements already, such as SFDR in the EU. And there are also concerns that the current voluntary system allows for potentially misleading information and greenwashing. And in fact, we've seen countries, including the U.S., starting to crack down on these concerns with recently announced investigations of companies over greenwashing. On the next slide. So in response to these pressures and concerns, the SEC has proposed a series of climate-related disclosures for filers. 
In their press release, the FCC stated that the goals of the proposed rules are to enhance and standardize climate-related disclosures to address needs expressed by investors, provide reliable information for investors to support informed decision-making, and to help issuers more efficiently and effectively disclose climate-related risks and meet investor demand. Next slide, please. So what are the next steps for these proposed rules? The public comment period ended last week on June 17th, and next the SEC will review the public comments and may revise the rules based on this feedback. If the rules do go into effect, they will be implemented using a phased approach based on filer and disclosure categories, which Gwen will discuss in a few minutes. And initial reporting for certain disclosures would first be required in 2023 for large accelerated filers if the rules are implemented as proposed. So with that, I'll turn it over to Gwen to go over the proposed disclosures and implementation timeline in more detail. Thanks. Thanks, Olivia. Um, I'll now move into the next slide to highlight some of the most salient points of the proposed rule. Um, so at a really high level, the SEC is recommending amendments to their existing Regulation SK in subpart 15 hundred of the following four categories. Um, first, public companies in the U.S. will be required to report their climate-related risks, um, as well as material impacts of these risks on their business strategy and outlook, um, as well as their governance of these risks. Um, regarding greenhouse gases, companies will also need to report their scope one and two greenhouse gas emissions, um, and potentially also their scope three emissions. In addition, some companies will need to get assurance that their reported emissions are accurate. Um, if companies have established greenhouse gas emission reduction targets or climate related goals, they'll need to report those and provide um, transition plans as to how those goals will be achieved. And then finally, companies will need to report how this climate related information will translate into their financial statement metrics. So we'll look a um, at each of these items in a little bit more detail in the following slides, starting with climate risks and management. Um, so as, as Olivia alluded to, SEC is aligning with an existing framework for climate-related disclosures, that is the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures, or TCFD. Um, and they're doing so because it really represents a balanced approach to climate disclosures with um, both global recognition and global reach. Um, so TCFD has a focus on strategy, risk management, and governance around climate-related risk opportunities. Um, in terms of the SEC proposed disclosure requirements, they're looking at climate risks and their impacts. So both of those are depicted in the um, with examples um, in the image um, figure to the right. Um, and as you can see, climate risk is comprised of both physical risks and transition risks. Um, specifically in terms of the SEC disclosures, um, SEC is asking for disclosure of how climate-related risks have had or are likely to have um, a material impact on the business and its financial statements, as well as how climate risks have or will likely have an impact on a company's strategy, business model, and outlook. Um, Companies will also need to disclose the nature of physical and transition risks, and for physical risks, also some locational information. And then these risks would, um, I just want to note, be looked at according to short, medium, and long-term time horizons. Um, additionally, the SEC is requiring disclosure of risk management and governance information, including a company's process for detecting and managing climate risks, um, a description of whether the climate risk process is integrated into a company's broader risk management program or risk management framework, and how a company's board of directors and management, really their leadership, oversee climate-related risks and that risk management process. Um, finally, if a company has adopted a transition plan, they'll need to disclose a description of that plan. So on the next slide, we have greenhouse gas emissions. And just as a really quick refresher, um, I'll just point out um, emissions of greenhouse gases can broadly be binned into three different categories. Scope one emissions are direct emissions from a company's operations. Scope two emissions are indirect emissions from purchased or acquired energy like electricity or steam. And then scope three emissions include direct, indirect emissions from both upstream and downstream from in within a company's value chain. Um, so under the proposed rule, companies will need to develop and report their scope one and two emissions inventories. 
Um, scope three emissions will be required reporting if those emissions are material or if a company has set a greenhouse gas reduction target that would include those scope three emissions. Um, within these metrics, there's a, there are a few details to bear in mind when looking at reporting requirements. So for instance, um, greenhouse gases need to be reported both aggregated to CO2 equivalent, as well as disaggregated by gas. Um, additionally, companies will need to report intensity metrics or greenhouse gas emissions per unit revenue or per unit produced, for instance. And then finally, um, in the regulation is fairly prescriptive in that the calculation approaches, assumptions, and methods also need to be reported. Um, one point to note is that depending on the filing status of a company, you may need to plan for greenhouse gas data assurance, um, basically ensuring that the process of compiling your inventory is robust with traceable and reliable data that can be audited. And then finally, I just I do want to mention that um, many companies may be facing the very beginning of their greenhouse gas reporting journey. Um, some companies may already collect and report on scope one and two emissions. That said, scope three is likely to be a challenge for most companies as the, you know, the data may have to come from companies that are within your value chain over which your company might not have direct operational control. Um, so this could represent really a major lift requiring companies to plan ahead for proper data collection and analysis. Um, I'll also note that the SEC does include a safe harbor provision for scope three disclosures, um, essentially providing a limit on the liability of disclosures only when they're made on a reasonable um, good faith basis. So if we look at the next slide, um, talking a little bit about disclosure of targets and goals. Um, if a company has established public targets, whether those are emission reduction targets or net zero goals, they all need to disclose information such as the scope and calculation of the target, um, baseline and target year, how they plan to achieve those targets, as well as their progress toward achieving those targets. Um, additionally, companies will need to disclose whether any carbon offsets or renewable energy certificates or RECs are being applied in pursuit of their target. And then finally, on this next slide, I do want to just briefly note that companies are also required to report um, financial metrics related to these climate disclosures. So these would include impact metrics such as climate related impact of physical events and transition activities on um, line items within your financial statement, as well as expenditures and cost metrics to meet climate targets and um, really to address climate risks. Um, so on the next slide, um, we can see um, the schedule as currently proposed by the SEC. Um, I'll note that that top timeline does depict the, the fiscal year. Um, so as you can see there, as and as Olivia mentioned, they're incorporating a phase-in approach to these disclosure requirements um, with some variation according to filing status. So for example, for large accelerated filers, the disclosures would begin in 2023 with additional requirements coming into effect in 2024. Um, assurance of this information would begin in 2024 with only limited assurance required for the first two years uh, before moving on to reasonable assurance. Um, for those accelerated and non-accelerated filers, the disclosures would begin in 2024, and similarly, assurance would begin later for accelerated filers, while all non-accelerated filers and some SRCs are exempt from those assurance requirements. Um, and just before we move on, I just want to, one of the major takeaways here, um, I think, is that while this rule is, of course, not final, um, there could be very significant time and effort required to comply with the rule as it's currently written. Um, just an, as an example from our own history with TCFD assessments, um, climate risk assessments that Stantec has supported clients with have typically run between three and six months with entities with multiple assets or sort of really complex technical challenges running even longer. Um, and so companies will really need to ensure that they're properly allocating time to comply with this rule should it go into effect, or these rules as should they go into effect, um, as we look at phase in potentially beginning in the next six months. Um, and so with that, I'll hand it over to my colleague Tim to cover some of the major compliant, major challenges associated with the, complying with the rules that's currently written. Thanks a lot, Glenn. Glenn, that was uh, very, very helpful. 
uh, I'd like to speak for a few minutes uh, about the compliance challenges and some strategies to address those challenges uh, that are posed by the proposed SEC climate disclosure rules. There are, uh, as, as I think it became clear from both Olivia and Gwen, there are, this is a very large set of rules and it's over 500 pages, uh, very complex, dense set of prescriptive uh, requirements for complying. Again, these are proposed rules. Uh, but one thing that's true about these rules, I think everyone needs to understand, is that these rules are predicated on well-known uh, frameworks such as the TCFD framework, as was indicated, and the G, uh, greenhouse gas protocol. So while these are really complicated rules, we in the sustainability community are, are well experienced in much of this. That said, a company that is entering this journey for compliance really would be well served by having internal and external experts, subject matter experts in especially the TCFD protocol so it out in helping companies in complying with the TCFD framework and also with uh, the greenhouse gas protocol. And we've learned a lot about the nuances to, uh, to comply with this and some of the strategies that we found have been particularly helpful. So we'd like to talk about some of those strategies now, but before I go any further, I think it's really important to understand this is that, that investors for several years have been increasingly challenging companies and requesting from companies the kinds of information that are embodied within this framework, this, these proposed rules. So whether this, this law passes or if it passes with substantial changes the fact of the matter is is investors will increasingly ask companies for this information for things like uh deciding whether to invest and capital allocation so they're quite quite important stakes so it's rules or not proposed rules or not it's good to have a good understanding of the underlying tcfd framework and the greenhouse gas protocols that are embodied within these rules on the next slide, I'd like to talk about implementation challenge, uh, challenges uh, for reporting. And these largely can be put into about three, three categories. The first is implementation challenges. And that's a lot of the things that both Olivia and Gwen were talking about, you know, the, the expansive scope of these reporting rules, uh, the timing, what type of filer you are, what type of information you'll need. So those, there's a whole suite of challenges that we'll talk about a little bit more here in the presentation. Um, another type of set of challenges are liability. The fact is, and we'll talk about this a bit more too, these are actual filings, not unlike financial filings to the SEC. So there are inherent increases in liability for corporations and officers for these kinds of filings. So that's a really big issue that companies would care about. And to address those implementation and liability challenges, we believe that companies would be very well served to have the appropriate subject matter expert resources internally or and or externally in technical aspects of climate change and climate risk characterization, as well as accounting and uh, legal support. So with that in mind, we went through the rule in quite a bit of detail, and that coupled with our experience in the greenhouse gas protocol and the TCFD framework helps us to identify those issue, core issues and strategies. And we have a lot of those types of issues and strategies we've identified. I'd like to give you some examples now. Uh, the idea here being to give you a kind of a taste of some of the things that your companies are going to have to deal with. If you are interested in talking more about these issues and strategies, we're obviously very happy to talk after the webinar and in, into the future. So on the next slide, we talk about the, one of the first core issues, and that is the issue of materiality. 
Uh, next slide, please. Uh, one of core to a lot of the SEC filings, whether these are climate or financial or otherwise, is this concept of materiality. And it's important to understand what materiality is just generically and then within the context of climate risk and climate disclosure. Generically, SEC leans on a Supreme Court decision from the 1970s that defines these risks as a substantial likelihood, a risk with a substantial likelihood that a reasonable investor would consider a particular risk important. So in other words, and to provide information so that investors have a good understanding of the particular risk in question, material risk, to decide if they want to invest or not. From a climate change and climate risk perspective, what does that mean? Well, what that basically means is that companies have to start taking into account both their direct and their supplier value chain, you know, upstream and downstream considerations for climate risks, not only now, but into the future. And in fact, the rule uh, request, uh, request uh, filers to look at potential climate risks in the short term, the medium term, and the long term basis. And so they're making predictions of climate risks. So companies might reasonably say, well, what's short-term, medium-term, or long-term? And that's not defined because that might vary from company to company. So there's, there's, while there's a lot of prescription in these 500 plus pages, there's also a lot of gray area too. Further, uh, we need to, as, as Gwen pointed out, look at the physical risk you know, from things like drought or you know, climate-induced with sea level change, floods, uh, wind storms, and transition risks for example, putting more money into low climate risk products, policy changes, and that kind of thing. So we have to, and we have to look at those physical and transition risks, again, not only now for a company for filing, but also going into the future at those different time intervals. So that's a lot. And companies who are not used to doing that will have a lot of questions right off the bat. So what can a company do? Well, what we found in working with companies in the US and globally is that this T the TCFD framework has been extremely valuable and prescriptive in getting our heads around this, these issues and helping us in, in complying with, the, with these questions. On the next slide, I'll talk about the next issue. And that is that of scope three emissions. And we've already talked a little, Gwen has already talked a little bit about scope three emissions. Uh, but there are there are a number of issues with scope three emissions. And, and of course, this has been probably one of the most challenged aspects uh, and the result and the subject of comments made for, for the proposed rules during the comment period that just ended, I believe, last week. So there are questions about, well, what, what are material scope three emissions? What data do you use since these are, these are emissions from your suppliers and from your distribution framework and your, and your customers? What, what methodologies do you use to derive scope three emissions? There's, there's a lot of issues and the rules are, the proposed rules are fairly prescriptive and they give a, a set of considerations for determining if scope three emissions are material. For example, if the makeup of the scope three emissions present a significant portion of emissions for your company. And as a comparative purpose, approximately on average, 80% of most companies' emissions are scope three emissions. So it's often more likely than not that a lot of the emissions from a, a particular company are from scope three emissions. That's why we have the picture of the iceberg with most of it underwater, which you don't really see. Also, again, if uh, the greenhouse gas emission targets have been, or goals that involve scope three emissions have been provided, have been uh, announced by a particular company, then, then that's included too. And even in the case of where emission, scope three emissions may be relatively small, if they are their particular focus, regulatory focus or or present a particular risk, then they also still could be uh, considered material. So if after going through this sort of somewhat complex materiality analysis, your company decides, well, okay, we believe our scope three emissions are material. Then the question is, well, what data do you, where, where do you get data that is 
of emissions that aren't even part of your own company. Well, there are fortunately uh, published uh, emission factors that are used to for different processes and materials such as you know concrete or steel production, that kind of thing that are useful then uh, for companies to use along with some of their data to try to decide, determine if something in the magnitude of the scope free emissions. But once they have, once the company has data, what, what methodology would they use? Well, fortunately, uh, the greenhouse gas protocol uses, has a corporate value chain standard that incorporates those emission factors and other data that allows companies to derive for a particular filing year what their, what their presumed scope three emissions are. Now, again, this has been a very challenged aspect of the current proposed rules. And the SEC understands the inherent issues with trying to figure out and derive scope three emissions for a particular company. So if, if the company demonstrates due care and uh, in developing their scope three emissions, the uh, Security Exchange Commission provides a safe harbor to protect the company in its filing. On the next slide, we'll talk about the next one of the next core risks. Next slide. Um, another issue are disclosure triggers. And this is the, the, the issue here is that companies through sincere efforts to try to, shall we say, transition to a lower climate, climate risk future could end up inadvertently triggering disclosures. So what, what, how would that happen? Well, if a company has any kind of climate related target, has adopted some kind of low uh, climate risk transition plan, or has used, for example, scenario analysis to look at predictions of you know, near-term, moderate-term, and long-term impacts, or maintains, for example, internal carbon price among other issues, those kind of things can trigger disclosure. So how do we deal with that? Well, one of the ways that companies might think about strategically dealing with that is understanding very clearly what the disclosure triggers are, and then communicating those to their board as well as their sustainability staff so that when planning and decision-making of future actions occurs, understanding clearly those dis dis disclosure triggers will help companies in strategically uh, pushing forward with their decision-making. Next slide, please. Another issue is that we, we mentioned earlier here in the webinar are disclosure liabilities. The, the fact is, is that plan information required by the rule will generally be formally filed with officer certification rather than just informally furnished to the SEC. And this could result in increased liabilities. In fact, I believe uh, Olivia mentioned lawsuits for greenwashing and increased SEC enforcement actions for disclosure climate disclosure. So, so how do companies deal with formal filings like this for something new like, like climate disclosures? Well, one of the very first things is, again, once again, and this is sort of a common theme, is to really understand the requirements. It's very important to understand the requirements. The second is to then consider these climate disclosures in the same vein or analogous to and with the same seriousness as financial disclosures to the SEC. And when disclosing, companies uh, would be very well served to look at a couple of issues within the disclosure. Number one, from a technical perspective, will the, is the disclosure defensible? Are the targets, the any announced uh, targets such a net zero goal, is that something within a time frame that the company really believes sincerely it can deliver on? Because the SEC will look at this and will look at these disclosures every year and, and monitor the progress of companies towards their announced goals for uh, low, low climate impact and low, low climate risk uh, transition. So it's really important to have the technical people looking at the disclosures and the information in disclosures to ensure that whatever, whatever announcements the company is making are achievable. The second is to have legal 
support to make sure that the language within the disclosure is something that the company can live with and it protects the company. Uh, next slide, please. The last, the last issue we want to talk about today is uh, attestation requirements. And basically the proposed rule requires an attestation report for an independent greenhouse gas uh, emissions attestation provider, basically an independent verification or validation uh, for scope one and two greenhouse gas emissions for Excel, large accelerated accelerated filers after the first disclosure year. So what does that mean? Well, basically the same kinds of skill sets needed to help provide technical information for filers is also used once a filing has been put together and an independent third party reviews it for accuracy, veracity, et cetera, et cetera. So for example, Stantec can help and Stantec has helped frequently over the years, companies in putting together this kind of information, for example, for investors uh, from a technical perspective. Uh, Stantec has also uh, looked at uh, and verified, acted as an independent third party verifier. The only thing is, is that a company cannot use the same, same service provider to help develop the information as well as verify the information. That would be, of course, a conflict of interest. So uh, companies are well served to have, the, again, the external and internal support to help in providing, developing the technical information for a filing, as well as then, in this case, an attestation uh, verification validation of the, of the work itself from a, yet another provider. And with that, I'll turn it over to Yasmin to talk about uh, insights for reporting. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tim. Um, so, so far we've uh, learned from Olivia the background and goals for the uh, SEC regulation. Uh, from Gwen, we heard about the details of, at least high-level details of what the uh, requirements are for reporting and disclosures. And from Tim, we've learned about the challenges at a very high level uh, that this regulation can pose. So as you can see, um, there are multiple aspects of this rule and challenges that need to be considered uh, when preparing and planning for compliance. Um, we understand that the rulemaking is still ongoing and can significantly impact the planning process. So um, when building a compliance program for SEC, you may be wondering how will this program be similar to or different from perhaps other existing compliance programs at your company, whether regulatory financial or environmental programs or voluntary programs. Um, how will this program um, meet several overlapping yet many unique requirements of multiple stakeholders? You might also be interested in understanding what criteria should be considered to create a successful program that meets re these requirements. Um, Stantec has developed multiple climate, greenhouse gas, and sustainability programs for our clients for over two decades that support regulatory and voluntary climate reporting requirements. We've built both simple programs that address one or two regulatory or voluntary frameworks and complex programs that meet the requirements of multiple stakeholders and diverse technical needs of companies. Um, and as we built these programs, we've captured a few lessons learned from our extensive technical work across multiple organizations and developed key insights for our clients to consider when developing the SEC uh, climate compliance program. Let's look at a few of them. Next, next slide, please. Um, understanding requirements and prioritizing um, response rates. The SEC rule has many detailed requirements for climate reporting and will require a robust program to provide audit trails and to demonstrate appropriate controls that maintain data integrity from source to sink. All of these efforts requiring your company to build out this program with significant efforts within a short period of time with limited resources. 
So it is critical for companies to understand the requirements of SEC rule and to prioritize them based on company-specific criteria. If unprioritized, resource allocation may be mismatched, creating additional risks. For example, um, too much effort may be allocated towards requirements that may not be material issues, or vice versa, too little time and effort allocated towards material requirements. Um, let's revisit the example that Gwen mentioned before. It is important to understand the level of effort necessary to complete climate risk assessments. Um, as she said, depending on the complexity of a company's operations, the number of facilities you may have, and the existing regulatory frameworks that you may be dealing with, climate risk assessments can take three to six months or even longer. Therefore, companies should think about this and prioritize and build a timeline that includes conducting climate risk assessment activities. In another example, uh, we highlight effort that may be necessary to meet uh, accuracy requirements of greenhouse gas emissions data. Unlike data that typically relies on financial transactions, technical greenhouse gas emissions data may be dependent on direct measurement devices or fuel meters instead of financial records. Reliability and accuracy of these devices or fuel sampling and monitoring or even equipment specific technical information. We've seen more often than not that while existing regulatory programs um, like your air quality programs or other greenhouse gas programs can provide some of the technical information, the quality of the information provided may or may not meet the quality uh, or auditability standards of the greenhouse gas or climate frameworks. So companies may have to begin establishing these quality control procedures and create a clear audit trail, which can take longer than initially assumed. Therefore, companies may need to plan for developing these quality assurance procedures and quality control procedures and build that into their timelines. Um, therefore, to build a successful SEC program, it is important to consider uh, the various requirements evaluate the underlying technical needs and requirements, um, understand companies' current status, and prioritize the response efforts by applying these company-specific criteria of materiality, accuracy, controls, timelines, strategy, and other criteria that a company might have. Next slide, please. So insight number two, integrated science-based programmatic approach. What do we mean by that? Um, when considering an approach to building the SEC compliance program, as mentioned, companies will most likely uh, leverage existing data, people, processes, and systems to avoid duplication of efforts. While this approach can provide an overall top-down methodology to build an integrated program, we have learned that it is not sufficient when it comes to greenhouse gas and climate programs. Let's look at look again at the greenhouse gas emissions data example. Um, greenhouse gas emissions data can rely on measurement devices. If the source of the data um, is a meter and the data is already available through another existing regulatory program, a company may initially take the top-down approach and identify that measurement device as the source of data without a need for additional verification, for example, verifying the evidence of accuracy of the data source or the, or the fuel meter itself. In this example, uh, companies using just this top-down approach may have compliance issues surface during audits. Um, the company may fail to demonstrate accuracy of the meter itself or any other source or explain differences in seemingly similar reported data under various programs. What we've observed that in addition to the top-down approach of building and managing a compliance program, a bottom-up science-based or evidence-based technical approach uh, to compliance is critical for a successful climate program. 
With evidence-based approach, companies establish a clear audit trail for all technical data. They evaluate the sources of technical data, quality assurance and control procedures, and uh, evaluate whether a, call, a, a clear audit trail can be established for all the reported technical data. We've observed that companies applying an integrated science-based approach, incorporating both top-down and bottom-up approaches, have been able to demonstrate compliance much more easily during audits and clearly explain any differences between publicly available information for seemingly similar reported data across multiple programs. Next slide, please. Insight number three, establishing a blueprint for compliance program followed by automation for efficiency. Um, what do we mean by that? So automation of processes through tracking databases and dashboards is critical for companies for efficiency, communication to multiple stakeholders, decision making, and other efficiency benefits. Uh, we're also seeing emergence of several climate data solutions that provide the necessary automation and dashboards. If you are considering automation and data solutions for the SEC compliance program, uh, we would like to offer this insight. Um, in our experience supporting climate and greenhouse gas program development and automation, we've learned that successful implementation of automation is highly dependent on if a company has all the compliance pieces in place, what we call a blueprint, before automation. We observed that companies that had first laid out a clear blueprint establishing the compliance data, people, processes, systems, and clearly verifying the technical accuracy, evidence, audit trails, and programmatic links before considering automation, were successful in the implementation. These companies avoided significant costs and resources associated with automation rework that came with not having a clear blueprint in the first place, especially when the rules are in flux, just, just like the current SEC rule. Um, these companies also avoided compliance issues, which typically surfaced earlier during the blueprinting process before the automation was in place. Next slide, please. So with these insights and other lessons learned from our experience, um, we compiled this roadmap for our clients to build the SEC compliance program. Um, this incorporates a phased approach. In phase one, the focus is to understand the applicability of the requirements to facilities and equipment, understanding all the details, especially the technical details. In phase two, the focus is to then conduct a gap assessment using the integrated evidence-based approach to create a gap closure action plan and schedule. In the third phase, the company would begin implementation, building the various compliance pieces as part of the overall technical compliance blueprint. And in the final phase, the focus is on automation to align with the compliance blueprint. With that, I'll hand it over to Chris to talk about what can we do now to prepare for compliance while the rule is still being finalized. Chris? Thank you, Yasmin. Uh, again, I would like to emphasize that these insights are based on our experience working with clients over multiple se sectors. And uh, uh, But as we've heard, uh, this rule is not yet final. So uh, while we wait for the rule to be final, what, what should you be doing? What should you be thinking about? And so on our next slide, I'd like to uh, emphasize five key points that, that our panelists have, have discussed here, here today. First thing we'd, we'd recommend you doing uh, is to conduct or may perhaps update your detailed materiality assessment of climate-related risks to your business. Uh, Tim touched on this. This effort is not a cookie cutter uh, process and will vary from firm to firm, but common to every materiality assessment is a thorough uh, engagement with key internal and external stakeholders to better understand your climate related risks and opportunities, and then to prioritize them. Secondly, 
uh, Yasmin touched on this, establish a ro robust, verifiable climate data collection process. Uh, you can't make good decisions. You can't make good disclosures without solid data. Ensuring you have alignment and understanding with your accounting team, your operations people, and, and your supply chain managers is going to be very critical to this, this effort. Third, begin to analyze your climate-related risks and opportunities. Fortunately, the SEC rule uses the TCFD frameworks, so we recommend becoming familiar now with the S TCFD processes. Both Gwen and Tim did touch on this. Fourth, uh, once you have a handle on the climate risks and opportunities, you need to develop or update, perhaps refine, your, your climate strategy. Uh, for example, we typically encourage firms to integrate climate topics into their corporate risk register processes to, to help uh, institutionalize your efforts to, to manage those climate risks. Finally, for each of these actions, you should coordinate with climate experts like you've heard today and corporate counsel, your attorneys, to confirm that your near-term decisions will be appropriate for the long run. Okay, uh, so with that, uh, uh, we'll move on to questions that have been submitted. Uh, so I'd ask our panelists to, if you would, turn on your cameras uh, and we can uh, uh, begin to address any questions that have come in to uh, be submitted. And looking here, I would, uh, there they are. Um, Okay, uh, here, here's one. If um, maybe this would be best for Gwen or Yasmin. Um, so if the climate disclosure rule doesn't get approved by the federal government, then is there any compelling need for corporations to disclose this type of information to investors? And maybe Yasmin, if you want to take that and then open it up to the panel. Yeah, sure. Um, so yeah, good question. So I think, um, you know, while SEC is working towards uh, developing these mandatory requirements, um, even if that doesn't go through, uh, there's a lot of um, in, you know, you saw the, the slide where uh, Olivia was talking about the various pressures a company might be facing or might face in the future from whether they're your own investors asking for this information, uh, especially if those investors are sort of like also looking at this information from a from their evaluation standpoint. So SEC is um, only sort of mandating this, trying to standardize the process. However, we know that investors, insurance companies, and um, some of the other sort of uh, organizations are looking at this information and, and asking for this information. So you may not see that, um, you know, right now, but that is how the, you know, we're seeing the trend. Uh, a lot of investment companies are asking for this beyond SEC. Sure, sure. Anyone else? I like uh, to, I, yeah, go ahead, Tim. Oh, I would say I'd, I'd like to add to that, um, and that in fact TCFD uh, is actually mandated in a number of countries internationally too. So basically, U.S. companies operating in a number of countries would have to do that anyway. So there's a there are a number of like Yasmin and Olivia and Gwen say there's a number of compelling reasons to actually get up to speed on these on on the TCFD framework and the greenhouse gas protocol if this law passes or not. Sure. Yeah, and I, I would just add to that, I think, um, you know, of course, there are also other pressures to consider, including, you know, downstream pressures from your clients or customers or end users. Um, and then, of course, you know, there is, you may anticipate that there would be pressures to have this information readily available in order to participate um, in others' value chains. So that's something to, to consider as well. Yeah. Yeah, good. Yeah, good, good, good points all. Uh, so as, as companies begin to wrap their arms around these uh, these challenges, what types of, of uh, technical personnel or, or, or uh, administrative people within a company should lead this compliance effort? And again, I'd open that up maybe. Uh, ask me if you want to start and then uh, Olivia or uh, Tim to, to follow in. Yeah, um, I think from um, our experience, what we are looking at is um, uh, it's a team of uh, experts uh, that are uh, typically pulled together 
we're working with several companies around um, sort of organizing the teams and all of that. Um, so we're seeing, uh, you know, again, legal teams and then from, from beyond technical, right? So legal, uh, accounting, operations, leadership, all uh, so sometimes the board and the C-suite uh, are also part of these uh, discussions uh, leading this effort. From a technical standpoint, um, you know, having somebody who has greenhouse gas expertise, um, climate risk expertise. So it, even from a technical standpoint, it's not going to be uh, a single person who's going to know everything. You probably need a team of uh, experts who who have expertise in um, various niche areas of the climate. Um, you know, it's a it's a huge range. So there's a lot of various topics, and and you might have to bring experts for each topic. And if I may just add really quickly to that, I think those are very good comments by Yasmin. Um, the TCFD protocol uh, or framework rather um, strongly recommends that this all starts with the board because the board really drives this ultimately with then the sustainability staff, uh, perhaps a technical lead. But unless the board is on, if, unless the board is on board, it doesn't happen. Good point. Yeah. Uh, so here uh, one is a, a, another question coming in. Uh, so we have these different uh, layers of uh, companies that the SEC regulates. Uh, when is it anticipated that small companies need to do scope three disclosures? Uh, I don't know, is that Gwen, do you, you have insight on that one? Yeah, yeah, sure. So. Um, you know, as, as they're currently written, the rules don't have a phase in for scope three emissions. They do categorize those as exempt um, for SRCs or small, smaller reporting companies. Um, one just note, I, I would kind of major thread that we've seen um, in the public comments that were submitted during that recently closed, um, you know, comment period is that is really focusing on the balance between the utility um, and strength and usefulness of those scope three emissions reporting and the burden that scope three emissions reporting kind of puts on companies. Um, so, you know, this is an area that I think it'll be important for us to, to track and keep an eye on as the SEC potentially issues any updates. Um, and I would say that's, that's for not only SRCs, but also for other filing statuses. Um, yeah. So yes, I don't know, Yasmin, if or anyone else, if you have anything to add. Yeah, uh, definitely. Scope three is the uh, is the most uncertain and uh, with the highest level of burden because the emissions are outside of uh, outside of uh, control of a particular company. So basically, there's there are a lot of issues with um, you know quality of information that that a company might be able to collect about their scope three the level of effort it will take to collect that information and then any mandates on um, the type of reporting and any reductions uh, that a company might have to do as a result of all of this so th there's a th and and in addition to that scope three is um, it, there's not a set methodology on how to calculate scope three emissions. So uh, there are a lot of frameworks that are uh, considering um, uh, figuring out how to make this better. So there could be an evolution of methodologies um, over the next several years on scope three. So there's a lot of issues. So th there's a lot of pushback from companies, including investors, on you know if if this does go through, uh, what kind of uh, liability does it carry because of so much uncertainty? So that might that's it's a pretty significant part of uh, current discussion. Yeah. Oh, no, it, it, very very uh, prescient comments, uh, Yasmin and, and Gwen. Uh, I'm afraid, however, th that's all the time for questions uh, that we have now, respecting everybody's time at this uh, hour webinar. Um, so again, please feel free to reach out to any of us. Uh, you can see the contact information on the screen to talk more about your own projects or ask any further questions. Uh, we appreciate your joining us today. 
And again, a recording of this webinar will be sent to each of you along with links and some collateral information for your uh, reference. Uh, we'd appreciate any feedback you might have on this presentation, along with any requests for future sessions that uh, the Stantec team might provide. So until next time, on behalf of Olivia, Gwen, Tim, and Yasmin, and the rest of our Stantec team, thank you for your time, and we appreciate it. Have a great day.